everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I got a special presentation specifically about CRTs and uh, more notably retro gaming on CRTs. And uh, first I just want to say thanks to Dave and uh, his family and staff for asking me to be here. This is one of my favorite shows and I do a great job every year, um, especially since I'm local. I'm really appreciative of it. Uh, but anyway, I want to give you a little bit of information about uh, Retro Tech. This is a company I started almost four years ago now. And uh, we originally started uh, working on gaming consoles and repairs and modifications. And then eventually in 2016, I really started to dive heavily into CRT repairs and restoration. Uh, last year in June, I founded a YouTube channel, which is pretty much all about CRT restoration and repairs. And then since then, we've been able to restore over 200 uh, CRTs to date. So that's just a little bit about um, RetroTech. And I do actually have a mission statement for this company, and it's resurrecting vintage technologies for the modern world. So uh, that's just a little bit about RetroTech and the company. And today, uh, we're going to go through this presentation. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of highlight here. We're going to talk about a little bit about the history of CRTs. Um, we'll get into different types of CRTs and, of course, current uses, benefits, uh, why you would want to use a CRT, what's good, and also a little bit about what's bad about them. And then we'll look at what to look for when we're trying to hunt for a CRT, um, some of the reasons that CRT re restoration is important, and then we'll do a Q&A at the end if anybody has any questions. All right, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of brief history lesson on the history of the cathode ray tube. So believe it or not, cathode rays were actually discovered in the 1850s. So this technology goes back an extremely long time. And um, the gentleman in the middle of the picture is Julius Plucher and then Johann Wilhelm Hittroff. These two scientists uh, basically started the whole study of the cathode ray. Uh, they discovered it and then they shot it into vacuum tubes and watched it project shadows against the tube. And that was officially the first kind of CRT uh, tube technology starting. And then, you know, 40 years later, you've got Arthur Schuster. He uses an electric field of current to create deflection, which just means he's using electrical currents to move the beam that's being protruded through the tube and to give you a nice geometrical shape eventually on the end of the tube. In 1897, another gentleman started using magnetic fields, which is actually what is used now in uh, tubes. And then in the same year, J.J. Uh, Thompson uh, proves that cathode rays are made of subatomic sub particles known as electrons. So the electron and the shape of the atom was actually discovered through the cathode ray tube in the late 1800s. Uh, this is officially the first CRT that was ever made, and it was, again, 1897, so a lot happened around this year. This is a different gentleman named Frederick Ferdinand Braun. It's called the Braun tube. Uh, it was a cold tube, meaning there wasn't any electrical current actually powering it. You'd, you'd just send your beam of a current through here, and he would watch the beam of current go through the tube, and it was more of an electro, uh, or a, I'm sorry, an oscilloscope, so he's just reading uh, what the rays were doing or what the different currents were doing. We'll fast forward a little bit further and uh, we've got John Johnson and then Harry Weinhardt from Western Electric. They developed the actual first hot cathode ray tube, which just means electrically heated and powered. And then it is sold as a commercial product later that year. So this was not used for like televisions or anything at this point. This would have been more used for like Morse code technology back in um, early war. All right, so this is the major time then of technological advancement towards a picture screen. And this gentleman, I'm not going to pretend to know how to say his name from Japan. He, uh, in 1925, he had developed his own CRT with 40 lines of picture resolution. Two years later, he's over doubled that to 100. And then in 1928, he's the first person to ever display a human face on a CRT screen. Uh, in 1932, at the same time, if, at, right after all this, RCA is granted trademarks for the terms cathode ray tube 
and they did at that time begin making and developing a test unit. Uh, in 1950, RCA released that term back to everybody else that they could use it uh, for their uh, term. But this is a picture of the very first RCA trial set. Uh, it looks a lot like a record player or a piece of giant furniture. And this was actually kind of a weird setup because you could see the round picture face and the way it worked is that picture would reflect off a mirror on that fold up piece of furniture and you'd sit there in front of it and watch it off the mirror. Uh, not very effective and they actually weren't even able to get this sold yet the first couple or the first year because uh, the actual first commercial commercially made CRT television was produced by Telefunken in Germany in 1934. This would have been an all black and white set originally. And here's some pictures of those original CRTs. Uh, you know, these are huge, giant pieces of furniture uh, that just had a nice little screen in them somewhere. Uh, a lot of wood knobs. This was the style of TV back in the early 1930s and mid-1930s. And then we're going to move through some of the early years of CRT television. Uh, 1935 to 54 is pretty much dominated by black and white. RCA continued to hold a major stock and share of the actual market. Uh, they made over half the CRTs at this time. So back in the early or late 40s and early 50s, RCA uh, really began to try to develop a color TV. And the way they were doing that is through what's called shadow mask technology. And I'm not gonna get too different, you know, into all the details on this one about exactly what, you know, overly doing what a shadow mask, but I do have some examples of a little bit about how that works. Um, this first tube we'll go in at, that's not on, that's just a wood grain, is a shadow mask tube. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of difference between that and other tubes in a minute. But 1956 to 58, the first few television shows were broadcast in a color format that was acceptable and usable by these RCA screens. And then right after that, in the early 60s, color TVs just took off. And um, this was, again, this one right here is the very first color television that was ever made by RCA and pretty much anybody that was sold. Uh, you can notice it, ha it had a real roundish picture to it, so uh, that was really popular down in the early 50s. A lot of wood. Um, again, now we're moving into the 60s where they're starting to get a little bit more of a 4x3 format and more almost straight sides and a little bit bigger picture tube. And it's still a lot of wood, but mostly shadow mask technology all during this time. RCA is dominating the television market. So here's a little diagram of how shadow mask actually works. You've got your three electron guns, and that's what's giving you each, each your colors, red, green, and blue. That beam of light is shot through what's called the shadow mask you see on the diagram. And then that mask is a way to line up the dots in a pattern on the screen. And that's how you're getting your picture. Is it's just filtered through that and aimed at the screen to make the uh, pictures on the screen. And the original color beams were in that triangular pattern. And that's pretty important because it wasn't really an effective way to make a color picture. And uh, the alignment was changed later to straight three by or three in a row. And I'll show you that here at the top. That's an actual electron gun from a CRT mask or a uh, shadow mask tube. And it's got, they moved it to three in a row. They did that later to really increase the brightness on the uh, shadow mask tubes. And again, this whole area where this gun is, is in this area right here in the back of the tube. If you're not familiar with it, that's inside that that uh, glass vacuum right there. All right, so again, shadow mask tubes, they were produced for the entire lifespan of the CRT display. And you can tell them by, I put this picture up, they're actually curved on each side. So it's curved top to bottom, and then left to right or right to left. It's curved on all sides. That's always gonna be the situation for most you know, shadow mask tubes. So after, um, after a little bit of time, Sony is really getting interested in getting into the game of television. This is actually their very first television that they developed. It was a portable, eight inch, black and white only screen. And it wasn't projection type, so it was a, a transistor television. 
However, it was not, it was due to, it was break down a lot and two years later it was discontinued. It wasn't really a good seller, but it was their first television. I've got some higher definition photos of that again. It looks more like, I don't know, a spotlight or something, but it was an actual, the actual first television. So Sony really wanted to get into the color TV market. And in 1961, they started by going to an IEE trade show in New York, and the executives were just walking around, and they actually stumbled across a booth for a company called Autometric. And it was just a small a company that had designed um, what they called a chromatron color tube. It used a single electron gun where the three guns were replaced by one. And it shot, shot just one beam that was shot onto a vertical grill instead of that shadow mask. And then that was used again to separate the colors out through a little bit different method. But Sony was really, um, really interested in this technology of just having the one single beam shot. So they started developing the, what they did is they saw that and they immediately went into uh, developing their own version of this chromatron. And they worked with Paramount Pictures during the time. In 1964, they did reveal the first chromatron color TV set uh, later in the year, but it was produced the same year. And literally to be competitive, Sony sold it at half their cost. So they were losing tons of money, but they were they're confident, or they were confident at the time that they could get production costs down and try to make up money on the back end. Here's a picture of that early Chromatron, very first color TV Sony made. And again, this is not a Trinitron. This is officially still a Chromatron, but that's what it looked like. So the Chromatron nearly broke Sony. By 1966, they were not able to reduce the cost because the Chromatron technology was not easy to replicate. So uh, more competitors began to jump into the television market. They were all making shadow mass TVs. That technology costs were going down. Uh, Toshiba and Panasonic both jumped into the market or into the game and they had to buy the RCA license who owned the license for shadow mask. So they started making it. And so with more competition and Sony not being able to, uh, you know, balance those costs, they uh, continued at a financial loss till 1966. And then Sony executives, uh, they didn't want to give up on the search for a good color TV, so they kept 30 engineers on staff to just work uh, nonstop on a new tube. So it didn't take them very long, though, because they used a lot of the same things that they had from the Chromatron, and they pretty much completely redesigned it. And the Electron gun was able still to do the thing where it wanted a single beam separated out into three different colors. And then the new grill was called an aperture grill. And um, it's an electrically charged grill at the front to separate the colors out or the, make your picture screen on the front of your tube. So that was their big breakthrough. They finally made the tube and it was, uh, it was, it looks and sounds similar to the Chromatron because it's using one gun, but they actually just abandoned that technology and had to redesign it. That's really the only thing that's the same about it is the single gun. And uh, the final product was unique enough to apply for its own patent, which was very important. Uh, the, new Sony, or the new Sony tube was named the Trinitron, which everybody's heard of, from the root word Trinity for the union of the three electron guns into a single gun and then Tron from Electron. All right, so Sony's new Trinitron, it pretty much outperformed every CRT on the market. The single laser, or the single, I'm sorry, the single electron beam was able to go and burn brighter than any shadow mask at the time, especially since they were still making them in that triangular pattern at this time. Um, they also needed a lot less adjustment. Actually, the shadow mask tubes at that time, they'd come off the assembly line and they'd have to be uh, individually basically calibrated uh, per set with all kinds of issues but the uh, Trinitron didn't have that trouble it was a lot more user-friendly right out of the production production facility and Sony dominated you know 40 years of CRT production and we talked about the Trinitron and that's what I've got down here it's only curved along one axis so that's different where it's only curved along the right to left, or you know, horizontal axis, the vertical side of the tube is completely straight and flat, no curve. 
And um, it really wasn't until the, and so Sony again got licensing, they got a 30 year patent in 1966 and it went all the way to 1996. And that whole time, shadow mass tubes couldn't catch up with the technology uh, and really be hugely competitive on a uh, quality standard. So it wasn't until that patent expired that shadow mass tubes really started getting better and uh, advancing a lot in technology. So these are these early Sony Trinitrons. Uh, some of the first games have been played on, you know, these like, uh, that's just the 70s style, a lot of wood, not really um, any inputs yet on your TV, you're still using, uh, you know, RF signals. And then we move on to the 80s. Now that's an 80s set down there. It's, a, it's not, again, it's a sharp, this little wood grain one. So it's not, uh, but it's the same style as these where there's still a lot of wood grain, a little bit of the new, uh, you know, plastic on there. And in 90, the 1990s is really where TVs got into the whole plastic, uh, solid black or solid white, other colors. And that's just a picture of a lot of the Trinitrons that you most likely would have seen. Not, the 1990s is also a time when Sony brought their Trinitron to um, computers and computer screens and started with those uh, high quality CRT monitors. And then of course the 2000s, the last generation, you have the more square design, still silver, and then even started coming out with widescreen, high def, other versions of the CRT right towards the end of like 2006. It's pretty much when they were abandoned. All right, so I just want to go through a couple of modern uses. A lot of people know a lot of these things. Obviously, arcade cabinets, many of them out there are going to be loaded with CRTs. And um, retro video games are perfect for CRTs. They're all analog videos. Anything that puts out analog video signal is going to be best on a CRT in its native format. VHS, DVD, LaserDisc, any of those old movie formats are perfect for CRTs. Uh, retro PC, if you do anything where you're hooking up a retro old computer. And there's even a move more recently to do modern gaming on higher end CRTs. And I'll show you that at the very end a little bit. But there are some CRTs that are actually really well made enough to be able to still be usable today for even modern high def signals. And you can still stream older 4x3 content onto tubes like this, and uh, they'll always probably be used for test signals out of oscilloscopes. Um, so some of the reasons these are going to be your best options, there's no lag or latency added by an uh, analog television, and so you're not going to have any troubles with lag, which can be a big problem with uh, retro gaming on any kind of new modern display. You, you can really have trouble with lag. And uh, they're easier to connect retro gaming consoles to. They look better. You get the real, I feel like CRTs have a big part of the nostalgia of playing old games. It's just like a warm fire almost. You get a little nice feeling, you know, just part of the whole experience. Um, and it can, I put down here that retro gaming on a CRT can be cheaper at the beginning because once you start getting into it and want to get better console and better CRTs, uh, those start to go up a lot in price. Uh, much easier to use a CRT than a scaler. There are scalers out there that can help you get from uh, your analog signal up to HDMI, but those will either add lag or can be complicated and require firmware and a lot of uh, other things like that. And they definitely have some of the best picture screen controls you'll probably ever see on displays. And Again, CRTs are just designed for analog video, and most consumer CRTs and then pro video monitors, which are pro versions of the CRT, they can handle 240p and 480i video resolutions perfectly, and those are the resolutions that pretty much all your retro games are going to come out of naturally. And that's real, those, those two formats give extreme problems you'll, if you try to do that in modern televisions. They're not really designed to hold, display those older uh, video signals. I talked briefly about some of the higher pro end models that will do a full range from 240p all the way up to 1080i. And uh, then you got 
digital visual digital video started at 480p, and uh, that is one that can only really be displayed on VGA CRT monitors, 480p and up, uh, unless you've got one of those pro monitors that that can go through the whole spectrum of sizes. So nearly all flat screen TVs and monitors don't support 240p or 480i. And again, we talked about low quality scalers adding problems. And now let's talk about obviously the disadvantages of owning CRTs. They do take up a lot of power. Um, not, it's not a huge amount, but it is a significantly more than your, uh, your regular flat screen does anymore. They're of course big and heavy, and a large footprint. I mean, they take up a lot of space uh, if you get a bigger one. And then it, hindsight for the, to match that, you've got most, most of the time you're not going to find a display over 36 inches on a CRT. Some people do complain about the 480i flicker on a CRT, and that's just where the interlaced picture flickers back and forth. Some people pick that up with their eyes, and then some people really pick up the high frequency noise with their ears. Um, now, if you do get older, uh, you can lose that hearing ability, so there are some people that can't hear it at all. And most CRTs cannot display digital video signals. We talk about that. And they're so old now and been out of circulation for so long in production that they, a lot of them end up needing repair when you get them. I'd like to tell you a couple things here if you're going to ever be looking for a CRT. What you would want to do, uh, you know, how, uh, what's a good thing to checklist to check through? First, obviously, does it work? Does it turn on? And when you get it turned on, how does the screen look? Is it everything look kind of normal? It's really important now to, to focus on the brand if you can, because you don't, if you're going to take the time to get a big CRT, there's some brands you should look for, and maybe some brands you should just avoid. What inputs does the TV have or come with? Uh, what screen size best fits your situation? So CRTs do get as small, generally as five inches, and up to 36. What year was it manufactured? And all that stuff is good to study beforehand. CRTs, we're going to talk here for a second about consumer grade. Uh, these are just the inputs you'll see, excuse me, on a normal consumer grade CRT. And that's RF, which is the old screw-in uh, signal, which gives you pretty much the worst quality uh, available video. And then you've got composite inputs, or AV, which is your yellow, white, red. Uh, S-Video was a big improvement back in the 1980s-ish, uh, early 90s. And that was added to most TVs. And then the last input added on most consumer-grade CRTs in the United States, or North American, would have been component. And then earlier CRTs actually didn't call it component. They called it color stream. So you'll notice that if you look at an older tube and it says color stream on it, that's just a fancier word for component before they called it component. I've got some pictures here. Now this top one right here, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but the third input there is the color stream where it has the green, dark green, the blue, and then the red. Now if you see a CRT that's a consumer CRT and you're looking for one, if you see that input, that's probably going to be your best bet because there's not going to be any really fancy extra scaling. And that's really when tubes were high, highest quality and everything, even though you might find a newer one that has uh, more inputs like this one, there's a chance it's not going to have as good a picture as some of the color stream ones. And then let's get into some best brands. Obviously, Sony Trinitron it was the king of Sony, or I mean of CRTs. The best years to look for are between 1996 and 2005, if you're going to get one. This is a consumer grade, again. And just some tips, stay away from widescreen consumer CRTs and CRTs that are, con again, consumers that have HDMI inputs, because those actually have scalers built into them that will add lag, uh, kind of like your, H your HDMI would on an early flat screen or a modern flat screen. It, they just don't do very well, and most people are not happy with them. There are some really great shadow mask tubes. Again, this is after that patent ran out on Sony, 
Uh, here's two of the best that were ever made. You've got the Toshiba A or AF series. Uh, that one right there is an example of it. It's usually silver. Uh, it comes in a nice 32 inch model there. And then the JVC D series was also one of the best. This one had TV lines counts or resolution that would rival these pro monitors. Uh, 750 TV lines of resolution on that one. And those ones again get up to 36 inches and uh, have all the inputs that you'd want. But what about the best CRTs that were ever made? So from the 1980s till about the mid 2000s, most consumer or most companies that made uh, higher end consumer CRTs also made a commercial grade CRT monitor. These would have been professional style monitors and they were developed for pretty much three main industries. Uh, the medical industry, film and TV production, and then finally closed circuit television through security monitors. And those were all products that each one of these companies generally made. Uh, these pro CRTs, they did often cost about 10 times as much as your normal CRT or television would have. They have superior picture performance, uh, completely adjustable, and were unrivaled for quality uh, at the time. These are, these pro monitors are preferred for retro gaming, so that's what I've got down here to the uh, side of me uh, on the cart is an example of a pro monitor. And um, it, the reason it's so good is at the top end it supports RGBS, which is red, green, blue, and sync. That's gonna give you the absolute highest quality uh, video signal you can get from an analog system. And many models of these PVMs will support both PAL and NTSC video, so you could bring things that were outside of um, obviously this region and hook them up to this TV or monitor, excuse me, with no problems, it would display the uh, picture. Now there is something you should know that all monitors dropped the support of RF. So that was kind of what differentiated most of the times a monitor and a television. Monitors did not usually have RF or uh, any kind of frequency like that. They do have, we talked a little bit about the resolution. So this is just a close-up picture of that 240p signal on, um, on a CRT. These are obviously a couple of video games. These are pro monitors. And they produce this nice, you have to get really, really close, but they produce this nice scan line effect. And what's happening in that picture is it's a progressive picture. So on a tube, a TV tube has 480 vertical lines on it and all that this is doing is lighten up half of them and it's skipping a line interval in between each one of those and creating just a blacked out line. So that gives you just a solid progressive picture with no flicker and then that's what the scan line effect comes in and actually makes it look sharper. So this was, this was pretty revolutionary for video game developers back in the day because it was kind of a trick. No one really had used 240p like this uh, and they did a really great job of doing it to make a progressive scan for video games. So first, let's just take a brief discussion on the two pro monitors that Sony made, the two families of pro monitors. They were all, or as, is the way, or as it worked out in the consumer market, Sony was the leader in the professional market too. And they produced the professional video monitor, or PVM for short, those were specifically medical, security, and then smaller video editing. So like somebody, um, a lot of news stations use the PVM because a BVM would have been so much more expensive than even a PVM, but you were still able to do a lot of video editing uh, and, and use those for color verifications and things like that. They, there are some Sony medical PVMs that are branded as Olympus. So if you are looking for a PVM, you can look for Olympus branded monitors. If you see Olympus OEV, that's most of the time a just straight up Sony PVM with just a different sticker on it. However, Olympus was or did use Panasonic 
prior to Sony. So if you run into one from like 92 or 93, it'll look like this one where it have the shadow mask and it'll be a completely different tube. So just check it, make sure that it says, it'll actually say Trinitron on it still if it's the Sony version. Sony also produced a BVM, which is considered a highest level a monitor. It's for broadcast video. And uh, these were extremely expensive. They were used to edit movies, music videos, TV shows, and live broadcast television. And the BVMs are the best of the best the CRTs um, can offer. And they do have some of the highest video resolutions, the most supreme picture quality available for retro gaming or any kind of analog video signal. And that on the top is a lower end Sony PVM. And then down at the bottom, we've got the BVM. Um, but this is, so if you look here, here's just some common uh, models you might see. We got different sizes here. So most of them will look like this where they've got the knobs and buttons and uh, adjustments on them. But you'll also get ones like this one down in the bottom corner that are older and they have a cube design and really not very many buttons or anything. Those ones um, are still very good though and very desirable. So that's just kind of what a lot of those PVMs looked like. And then if we get into the BVMs, again, these were generally bigger. Um, they all had to have highly technical control boards. Sometimes you'd get them and they wouldn't have this control board down here at the bottom built into them. So there's a lot, uh, these are a lot more technical and a lot more finicky. So they are really great, but they do take a lot of patience and you have to study a lot and you know, they're almost like a, uh, like a high-end Ferrari. They always seem to need servicing and stuff. So if you're getting into um, monitors, it's best to start with probably a PVM or something else before you get into a BVM, unless one just falls into your lap. But there are two uh, that match the PVMs on build. So that 14M4DE is very similar to a PVM and not so much like the BVM. So if you see that one, or that 8044QD, they're all compact in one and don't have like the video cards and all the different issues. Uh, so those are really nice. And there are some shadow mask, again, pro CRT monitors. These are the companies that made them. JVC, Panasonic, Ikigami, and NEC. And that one on our picture right now is a JVC monitor. It's hard to see, um, but that one is JVC. Here's some of these models that you'll see. These are all standard, so they're, or except for this bottom one. They all just do 480i and 240p. Uh, you've got this Ikigami down here in the left-hand corner, JVC, which we saw the Sonic picture on, and then uh, there's a Panasonic version. And this XM29 is uh, highly desirable because it has a 29-inch screen, and it also can do uh, 480p. So it's, it's a very uh, desired pro monitor. So there are multi-format pro CRTs, and that just means that they are, these are again the best of the best. These are the ones that support 240p all the way up to 1080i. And uh, they do have all the features of BVMs and pro other PVMs. Uh, these ones get up to a thousand TV lines in resolution, which is pretty much the tops for any CRT. Uh, they do have a widescreen format in a lot of them. And the build quality is pretty much unmatched in these. All the parts are for the most part metal and have really high quality, um, really high quality capacitors and all parts in them is um, unbelievably complex and high quality. Again, I told you they do need a lot of maintenance. They are complex. They require external equipment. You can see how this one uh, that you've got here, you might find it and think it looks like a great monitor, but then you notice there's no buttons on it. Again, see how this one doesn't have any control pad built into it, so you actually have to pay a couple hundred dollars more for an extra control pack. Uh, so most of them are a little bit more complex and require more equipment and then are finicky sometimes, depending on the signal you can put in. Uh, there are a couple of PVMs that are really great that are multi-format and don't have all the same technical issues as like a BVM. And that's a 20 L or the L5 series. It came in two sizes, 14 and 20, and that's a 20 inch. That's a really great monitor. 
And then the BVM had two series of uh, monitors that went and did multi-format, the D-series and then an A-series. And the D-series is probably the most highly desired uh, monitor for retro gaming out there, especially like a 24-inch widescreen or a 32-inch widescreen. That's the only time you probably want to go with something that's a widescreen is if you get one of these. Uh, and then the A-series. But the problem with the A-series is it was made such at the end of the lifespan that they didn't really make enough of the video cards that support component or RGB. So you had to have an external card for that and they only made, I could only come up with production numbers of 300. So they literally only made 300 of this video card for thousands of monitors. And um, so just that video card is so hard to come by, it sells for sometimes $3,000, just the video card in that monitor. So, you know, you really probably have to stay away from the A-series. And if you're really wanting to go for something multi-format, you want to stick to the PVM L5 or the BVM there if you're going to get a Sony. There are shadow mask uh, multi-format CRTs, meaning the same exact thing. They can go up to 1080i, some of them. These are the Ikigami ads for some. Again, same similar build quality, same thing about needing different input cards and calibrations, but these ones are um, highly sought after, and a lot of people who, I've never had one of these multi-format Ikigamis. I've had a lot of the Sony ones, but people who have these say that they're, they like them better than the Sonys, so I know that they're really high quality. Which one? This part right here? That? So that's like a, that's an auto setup probe. So, oh, okay. yeah, so you can get it's a calib yeah, it's a calibration yeah. tool for uh, like white levels, and it you just plug it in and run a program. Does it just do white levels, or does it? Do it does a few other levels? things. Black levels. It can do quite a few color balances, pretty much. Uh, the problem again, though, too, with that is that it's hard to find the right auto or the two or I'm sorry, the probe. Probes can be expensive if you buy an original one. I do believe there are some knockoffs. Yeah, like there are some, you know, usable alternatives from what I've heard. I've never used, I've never actually used one of those auto setup probes. I've never, I've never had uh, access to one. And, um, but they are there and you just, you know, there's, there's plenty of information about if you end up getting one, how to use it. Because you just plug it in and plug it in the center and run some programs and the, the monitor does all the work. Uh, here's the JVC ones. Again, these are very nice if you come across one. Um, the good thing about these is uh, there is a guy, they, they generally have the same issue where there weren't a lot of the cards made for them for RGB, but there's someone in, um, there's a guy in, he's in, oh goodness, not, what's the, not Australia, what's the other one down there? Australia. Oh, New, Zealand. New Zealand, exactly. So he's from New Zealand, and he's reverse engineered the card on these. So you can get a RGB card for these monitors for like 60 bucks from him. So it's, you know, that, that's really great. And this is uh, one of the top CRTs. We talked about modern gaming on a CRT. This is it. This is the Sony GDM FW900. So if you ever see one of these and uh, in person and someone's not asking like over a thousand dollars for it, you better <laughs> grab it if it's working because these are getting up there to where they're starting to sell for three thousand dollars or more, just because there's not very many of them left. They have a sixteen by ten aspect ratio, and then there's some stuff on the native resolutions, but they just have a incredibly high refresh rate, no lag. And a lot of people have been starting to use them for modern PC games, and not only modern PC games, but also hooking up things like um, HDMI consoles, just like PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and using them on there just because of uh, the refresh rate. And also, you know, the good thing is you can change, CRT screens are so good at refreshing so fast that if you are in a game where you're moving across back and forth on a screen, you know, you're not gonna get any kind of jitters or anything you might get on an LCD 
or flat panel, yeah, artifacts. That doesn't happen with this, and you get that full like motion of picture the whole time, so people really love them. All right, so this is uh, some tips on best places to look for a CRT if you're looking for one. So first thing is always check with your family and friends because I'm sure like your grandma probably has one of these in her attic somewhere or somebody does this uh, wood grain one. And you can look at online local marketplaces, Craigslist, Facebook, uh, OfferUp, etc. for consumer CRTs and generally find good ones for pretty much next to nothing on there. There are social media communities that I've written here. These are two of them that generally do have monitors, as far as pro monitors, they will come for sale. Now it's not all the time, but like if you go to that Reddit page, they have a listing page on there, and it's just classified ads of people in the gaming community that have extra monitors that wanna get rid of them or sell them. So that's a really great one, that CRT gaming one. And then that Facebook group, they, people will go on there and list them. You can always go through eBay, but that can be, you know, anything like expensive on eBay. Plus, shipping is an absolute nightmare with CRTs. You can go to local government auction websites. That right there, ebid.nashville.gov, that's the one here in Nashville. So, eBid goes all over the country and has those in different areas. And I've actually bought PVMs from them that have come from... The public library, they also come from like a courthouse situation with, you know, um, trials. Uh, again, security, even like security monitors in jails. All those things eventually end up government waste or government auctioned off usually on these sites. The only real place left anymore to find these kind of high-end monitors in the wild is pretty much three places. Uh, TV and news broadcast stations do still sometimes have basements filled with these CRTs. You'd be surprised. The last load, these, this one down here came two weeks ago uh, on the cart. Uh, it was part of a medical load, but also with that load was a CRT load from East Tennessee from a news station, and they finally threw out all their stuff from the 90s. So. Um, that was one way to get them. Medical facilities do still hold on to them, and then recycling companies. And the best thing to do with a recycling company, if you try to contact them, don't try to contact them and tell them you, unfortunately, you can't tell them you want to buy just one, usually. You have to go and buy things from them, usually by the pallet. You get a better deal, but a lot of the stuff you get won't work. They don't really like to generally mess around with single sales. All right, now we can move on finally to some CRT repair and restoration. So I've got some pictures here of electrolytic capacitors that are in really bad shape. Uh, it might be a little hard to see on the pictures there, but this is generally when you get into a 25-year-old machine, you can see this pretty commonly, where you'll have extremely dirty caps, or on this picture over here on the left, you can see the tops of them is starting to peak and bulge. That's a sign those caps are dead. But not only that, there's always a lot of film, dust, residue on the boards. So what ends up, the average pro video monitor, for example, that one down there has about 190 electrolytic capacitors just like that inside of it. So that's a lot, uh, and they don't generally last longer than 20 years. So. It's always a good idea if you get a monitor for the first time to just look inside and observe the caps and make sure that they don't explode. None of them have exploded. None of them look bulged like that. Because if that thing blows up and leaks, what's inside of it is uh, all over the board. It can be really difficult to clean. And then it can also corrode your traces and cause very big problems with other more important parts on the board. Um, because what's, what's actually inside of a capacitor is, is these old electrolytic capacitors, it's nothing more than fish oil. So that's why if you turn on an old machine that hasn't been turned on a lot and you start to smell a weird fishy smell, that means you've got capacitor fluid on your board and it's starting to get hot and cook inside there and you're smelling fish oil from 30 years ago start to heat up. So 
Um, again, it's always great. Now, sometimes it won't look that bad, and you can just get in there and get a lot of compressed air and blow a lot of this stuff out. Um, the other problem with the capacitor is in the dust is the dust will build up on the capacitors themselves and if you get completely dusted over components that actually starts to act as, act as an insulator and um, as it gets hotter heat builds up inside there and it actually wears down your uh, CRT faster. All right, so obviously, like one of the big reasons for repair and restoration is preserving the hardware and the format. So I, it's very important you know, to always have something to be able to put these on their native form. And that's really one of the main reasons and obvious reasons uh, to, to restore and keep CRTs around. But there's a bigger issue, uh, and that's e-waste. So e-waste is a big, big problem that we're all going to be probably talking about the rest of our lives. You know, uh, this could be any electronics, but specifically CRTs are especially problematic. And I'll show you a little bit more on why. First off, in 2006, the EPA designated CRTs uh, marked for disposal, meaning if you say I'm going to throw away my CRT, then that CRT is considered hazardous waste because there's lead uh, blown into the glass itself, especially in the funnel area. That's all lead-lined glass. So the EPA came out and said it was hazardous, but they didn't make any rule or law that said you have to recycle it. They just encourage you to recycle or reuse it. Um, but the, the actual regulations are very, or they vary dependent on the district and the state. So some areas it's illegal to dump your CRTs, but like in Tennessee, it's actually not. You can just call your local uh, garbage man and they generally will just come pick them up. And of course you can imagine where they end up if they do that. So another problem with all this is CRTs are extremely expensive, hazardous, and difficult to recycle. As a picture on the left, it would be a normal recycling center where you can just see they are overloaded with CRTs, I mean hundreds there. And then this guy on the right, it's a little bit difficult to see, but in order to break those things down, you literally have to pull all the uh, plastic off, and you need to get this tube out of this frame and do so safely. Uh, and a lot of times this guy, you can't tell, but he's broken this glass. So there's a hazard in that. Uh, but it's just very time consuming and a lot of manual labor involved and chances to kind of get hurt. Uh, unfortunately, most CRTs end up in landfills. Uh, or even worse than that, is they're shipped overseas and they end up part of a dangerous metal scrapping trade. And so CRTs, there was a time period where CRTs were actually, you'd go to a recycler, you'd say, I'm going to give you my CRT. They say, yeah, we'll take it. And there was, excuse me, there's been many times you can go look on YouTube and find hundreds of videos of news channels exposing these recyclers. They were actually taking the tubes out of the CRT. They'd load them all in sea containers, and then they'd ship them to China, or they'd ship them to Africa. And they were saying that these used, damaged, bad tubes were reusable to get around the paperwork of the EPA. So they ended up over in landfill or in the middle of, you know, pits in these third world countries just being built up. Um, so, but again, CRTs are a huge part of this because the glass is just, there's no viable way to reuse that glass if it's busted. So this next picture is a little bit difficult to look at, but uh, it's, it's a good example of what really happens to a CRT. And at first sight, it's kind of difficult to see what's going on here. But this is a back of a CRT 
there's the buttons of the CRT. And the goat is actually standing in the shattered glass from the tube. And the boy, he, you see he's got a little tray that he's carrying all his scraps in that is good. That tray is the actual shadow mask from inside the CRT. So he's broken the glass. He has no shoes on. He's broken the glass, gotten the, the metal out of the glass, and then he's filling that up with the components because the CRT, it does have a lot of copper in it um, that's not attached to it. That is salvageable. And then the circuit boards actually have lots and lots of gold. So you can scrap CRT scrap um, circuit boards if you just do that those are very desirable for scrapping because they have so many highly uh you know ex expensive metals to get out of them and that's what that kid will do he'll go do that and then sell those to somebody in his town uh, but the good news is there are plenty of great crts available <laughs> uh and every retro gamer should own at least one <laughs> or like my friend here 10. uh so it's, you know, that's, that's pretty much it for the uh, presentation today. Um, thanks. There's my information again. And if you guys have any questions about anything I talked about or anything randomly about CRTs, I'll be glad to answer anything now. Schematics on an old RPC, CRTs and for repair, are those readily available? Yeah, yeah, you know, surprisingly, um, communities, for example, like the Reddit community, but even other uh, Nintendo Age, Atari Age, other uh, people have been doing a great job of scanning in these, um, a lot of these schematics because you can, uh, especially any pro monitor, you'll be able to find the schematic for no problem. It's well documented, PDF, you can usually get them for free off of that Reddit page, actually has them listed there. And even the D-Series and the Toshiba and a lot of those high-end models I listed, if you go to that CRT Reddit group, they actually have a page that's dedicated to that, just the specs and all that. Um, and even like consumer, not always, but you can still find them because what you can do with a lot of the CRTs is mod them. So you can not only repair them but you can tap into the video processing chip on the CRT circuit board and add um, add an input for RGB similar to these monitors or like your arcade and it's it's a it's a way of just tricking it but there are like a lot there's a lot of people that do that because it's it's easier and at the end of the day it's a lot cheaper to mod a consumer set than to buy a uh, you know thousands of dollars on one of these other because you can take like a 27 inch and easily mod that and have a larger screen with the RGB high end inputs and get that scan line effect um, with those. So. Uh, <clears throat> how about you know a lot of these 20 and 30 year old arcade games in here? To keep them going, what are the things we should be looking at doing, or who can do that kind of work, rather than wait till they fail? Yeah, yeah, it's that's that's a great point. Um, it's always a heck of a lot easier to get in there and do the maintenance on one of these things while it's still working, as opposed to waiting till it fails and trying to figure out what went wrong. So, for example, in a uh, arcade cabinet, there's still a lot of great arcade uh, parts kind of manufactured, you know. So there are kits where you're gonna go in and if, um, if you get a, a monitor and you wanna restore the, or, or the game, you can get um, cap kits. You can either buy an actual cap kit for your chassis or you can just go through and either get the schematics for your chassis and build a cap kit out of the capacitors uh, or just look at the capacitors on the circuit board and verify what they are. So you change those out and generally if you can get a good flyback you can also change that flyback out and then there's like a hot you know um, I can't remember what the high occupancy high yeah transformer yeah that one uh, is part of the kit too so if you go through uh, when I would do when I do a restoration 
something like that. If somebody wants all those things, then that's like what you do. And at the same time, clean the board. And then uh, that's not really going to affect your tube at all. So, so you clean that board. And then if you have tube problems, you can go through and clean the tube. Um, there's some technique to like resetting the yoke on there, the deflection yoke, uh, which is, I don't know how many know what that might be. Let's go back to that tube picture and um, kind of talk about that a little bit because those parts um, do take a little bit of trick to fix. Let's see. Are you talking about All right, so. This is this part right here is your deflection yoke, and it'll be all the way up against the tube generally. However, you know um, that that's the magnet in it that's actually pushing your picture out. You know, so I'll be honest with you. I've had some times where I get into a new CRT, and um, it might have you know won wonkiness or convergence in the corners, especially. That's a big problem usually with them. And then you get around back, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the convergence strips, which is just a little, usually, plastic strip with a little magnet on the end of it. But you get in there, and it's messed up, and then you've got like 20 strips that some techs just kept jamming in there over and over and over again. And honestly, <laughs> it's so much that it's like doing nothing. It's just too much to do nothing. So um, when I get in and I get a part of restoration, I actually, there's one screw on this yoke. And it, again, this could be all powered off, obviously. But you unscrew that, just loosen that, and then you twi start twisting that yoke because it's been attached to that tube generally like 20 years. So you break it loose, and then you pull it back on the neck, you know, all the way up as far as you can, an inch or something. Remove all those strips, and then push it back against it, and then kind of start over see what you're looking at. Because again, it's really hard if you've got like corner convergence and again, you go back there and there's 30 magnets. You know, how you, what are you really gonna do to fix that? I'm adding more magnets didn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, that's it. Now, uh, there are like some really high-tech adjustments back here. I say they're high-tech, but they're not. It's just highly complicated. They're actually really low-tech because you're just spinning these rings right here, and that's that's affecting convergence and stuff. See, like the the there's three sets of rings on that, and the very first two um, they adjust your screen purity. So if you have like a white screen on the screen and you notice I don't know purple or a little orange in it, then you move the first two slides back and forth till that just balances out and hopefully gets white mostly, and then the ones behind it control, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the exact order is off the top of my head, but one controls like the red and then the other controls like the green and blue. So there's only, it's, it, that's really, really, I mean super, it's super troublesome. So unless you really have an issue, you probably shouldn't get in there. Most of the time those are going to be epoxied. So unless you just notice a terrible convergence issue, it's really not good to get into those too much. But that can be done, and that's how it was done originally. Any other questions? Storage? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So here's something. They are sensitive to temperature. However, CRTs can still, if they're not in operation, they can get up pretty high. Uh, I'm not exact, you know, and they can even go down to below freezing. It's just you got to keep them kind of above 20 degrees and below like 100 and then humidity will have a big impact on that obviously from it just sitting there. Now the, today was a really good example because I had some CRTs that I was uh, pulling out of my garage right and it's freezing cold and you bring them inside and it's like all of a sudden covered in conden condensation. That's obviously be a terrible idea for me to just plug it in and turn it on. So you have to like let them sit there and get up to ambient room temperature or you're going to have a huge amount of trouble. Um, but, yeah, if you, they're okay. If, honestly, if you're not using them, they're fine to be stored for long periods of time. 
Um, they can withstand a high, like there is a tolerance. Usually it will be in the manual to tell you an exact tolerance on the tube for the actual temperature it could be at. And it's generally, um, that temperature is generally less, a, a lower window when it's operating and then higher tolerance or, you know, it can stand higher conditions, hotter or colder, just being stored. So if you do come across CRTs that have been in like a storage warehouse or if like you do have obviously extras and you're keeping them in a storage unit or your garage, you're fine, especially in our temperature. But you're not fine if you go out and grab it out of the cold and try to go turn it right on. That's not, that's not usually a good idea. You want it to be over like 40 degrees um, on the tube itself before you fire it up. Safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. I like. I take that for granted because safety is probably. And I talked to Dave a little bit about this. If we want to, we can try um, maybe a repair session next year where I can open things up and and show a little bit more because um, CRTs do have some areas that have huge amounts of current running through them when they're on. Um, the biggest thing, obviously, is the anode cap. And I don't even know that I have a picture. It looks like there's not an anode cap on that tube in that direction, but it's generally gonna be in the top right here. There'll be a wire, big heavy duty wire plugged yeah. in up there. That's, that's where the majority of the high current's going through. There's also some spots on the neck board that have a lot of current when it's running that you don't, you can shock yourself at. Um, you know, CRTs, you, obviously you're not gonna do like a lot of the recapping and stuff. You do all that when there's no power in it and repair. But when you're making all the adjustments, they've gotta be running, right? Cause you can't, you can't tell what you're doing so you have to figure out how um, to safely make these adjustments. Uh, so it's, it's really just a methodical process of not taking anything for granted, really. Don't think too fast. You watch what you're doing when something's turned on. Um, now, the reason it is safe to work on while it's running is there are isolation transformers built into a CRT. So the current is isolating itself like through a ground loop rather than using you while you're touching it to ground to the earth. So that current's not gonna zap you while you're working on it. But if you grab the two wrong points, um, you know, you're gonna make a new path. And that's the most dangerous shock would be to have holding two points and have it go through like your heart. So if you, um, if you, you know, the first thing I did for probably the first, I don't know, uh, year was I always kept one hand in my pocket and tried to just work as best I could with one hand because you're not, if you, I, I mean, I've got scars all over my hand where I've zapped my hand on something and, and it's just a little zap, but it's not like the big zap where, again, if you were holding, or, yeah, you don't want that. So, um, you just, again, have to be extremely cautious. Um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube, a lot more detailing safety. So if you're concerned with that, I would definitely recommend watching at least the safety videos. And all you really have to do is probably go or look up on YouTube CRT safety. And I bet my video will pop up as one of the top ones because that's one of the ones that people watch the most. It's just how to safely get in there. And I pretty much in that video break down at the back of a CRT, what areas are, are more dangerous than others. But once you get, you know, once you learn more about that and just get comfortable, it, it will become a lot easier and, and you'll realize that a lot of things you thought were scary are just not, not really hazardous. Um, like when, when I first got started, you'll notice a very common issue on CRTs is that yoke will rotate a little bit somehow over time. And then your screen won't be s parallel straight, it'll be cockeyed. And uh, so that's an adjustment you're probably gonna do most likely. Um, you can do it by when it's turned off and turn on and see if it fixed it or, you know, but you can also do it while it's running. 
And that's just, again, loosening like this screw on this yoke and literally just rotating that yoke till it's straight on the screen. That's what's causing it to, it's just somehow through movement or something, the yoke just turns a little bit. So, uh, that, but that's, that's one that like looks extremely intimidating because it's so close to that anode cap and you're doing it while it's running. And there's, that's, that, you know, that yoke is covered in copper while like bare wires, but there's not, uh, there's actually a small film over those wires, so you can't, you can touch it and not get, it's not gonna, it's, it's actually insulated. Yeah. Question on x-rays, because uh, I, I spent 35 years, uh, five days a week, eight hours a day in front of CRT tubes. Yeah. Um, these were computer terminals. As soon as the first computer terminals came out, they were all CRTs. And 35 years up until 2005 or eight or so, we uh, got rid of the last ones. And um, that was 20 to 24 inches from the screen. And, um, and then multiple ones, up to five or six of them around you at a time. And uh, we read an article every once in a while about X-rays and how much radiation there is. Yeah. And it was it was especially programmers back then. Um, it was one of the uh, things that um, the question kept coming up. And uh, apparently, the, the smaller ones, up to 13, 14, 15, 17 inch diagonal size, um, the, the flyback was delivering about 10 to 12,000 electron volts, mm -hmm. which down in that range, I think the, the x-rays were small, but, but then when CRT started growing up into 30, oh, 28, 32, and 36 inches, uh, the amount of electron volts went from up to 20,000, yeah, 25,000. Yeah, over, over 25, yeah. yeah over 25,000, and that's where uh, I, I think later on we we're reading that uh, the amount of x-rays, that was significant. Yeah. And um, so, and then I wonder about, you know, arcade games, because, you know, here, I mean, if you're watching, see, it wasn't a, a problem because if you had a 36 inch TV and sitting 10 feet back because the energy dissipated yeah. with the square root of distance. Sure. So the energy is going, the x rays are going down like this. But the difference is on an arcade game, again being yes. the, the two feet from, yeah. the, from the screen, and, um, and, and, they're, and they're all open frame as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you didn't really have much. Shielding, well, wooden cabinets had no shielding, but yeah. plastic. Only later did I think they sprayed a, a metallic foil on the inside of plastic cabinets. Originally, the plastic cabinets were, I think, just plain plastic, and then they, just to keep the RF down, I think they started spraying the, the inside of the plastic with, with uh, foil or metal spray, metal paint. But uh, so, yeah, the question again is on. Um, the time exposure to to that. If if someone if someone's playing a game, though, I mean, uh, I don't know how long people play arcade games or sit yeah you know, that close to them. But the thing is, is uh, I mean, if if you're doing like I was programming eight, eight hours a day, five uh, forty hours a week, that that could add up. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, um, and that's actually something I didn't mention, but that was part of uh, the hazards. There is radiation levels that come out of a CRT now. I don't know. They ne I never could find anything exactly like saying how, how much or how, how much it's making, like how much of an impact it's making. And I think it's probably something that they just, now since CRTs aren't mainstream, and part of production anymore, that they're probably just abandoning further research. So if you go back and think about the day and age, I mean, during the CRT days, it wasn't, um, OSHA wasn't as um, mm -hmm. big a deal, and um, then people weren't, um, 
out just measuring everything. There wasn't a mindset to go out and, and measure as many hazards. Um, uh, they were measuring atmospheric type conditions. But as far as that kind of exposure, they figured, well, on a TV set, if you're just far enough back, you're safe. I think that was, that was it. But then there were the, these exceptions where people weren't. People were in front of it for a long time. Yeah. You grew up in a country that's um, a little bit smaller in landmass, and you are much closer to a television because the living room you grew up in is half the size of what you guys grew up in, yeah. like the Japanese. And they, they play their video games one feet from their television, and the controllers are really small, so that's going to affect it a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm screwed then. <laughs> I don't, I don't really, yeah, I don't know that, uh, you know, it's hard to tell because there's so much, so much energy too in a tube and then you've got things like, you got the high frequency sound coming out too, so you can sit there and I mean, who knows, some people probably could get headaches and um, not really, I, I don't, I mean, there, I'm sure there's a possibility of somebody's equilibrium, you know, getting messed up by CRTs possibly because uh, of just the way there's an extreme amount of energy in them, extreme amount of energy coming out of them, and then um, there's, you know, stuff emanating from them. I mean, there's, there's a reason they're hard to get into the back of, too, because like you say, not only is it dangerous, but there's, especially like in those pro monitors, there's lots and lots of shielding, extra shielding, extra ground loops, extra... Um, they started adding things like ferrite cores in them, you know, to try to limit a lot of this extra radiation coming from the cables and sound from the vibra, you know, power cables. So uh, it's obvious looking at it that it was a problem, but I just think it was more of a mitigated problem than actually solved. Um, I do get the question a lot if I think people will go back to making CRTs again. And unfortunately, I don't. Uh, probably see that as being a real option because you're going to have one heck of a time getting some kind of government to let you make more new glass lead tubes in the world. I don't know. You might be able to go somewhere. And the, the phosphors are not good for you either. <laughs> if you get cut with phosphors, you've got a you know, wound that doesn't want to heal. Yeah, I bet. I know. So yeah, both of those, um, it's just, I think that like, I guess the EPA just honed in on the lead. Well, it's strange though, because I mean, it's, vacuum tubes are a distant relative of life um, to CRT, uh, vacuum mm -hmm. tube. Uh, transistors just about put them out of business, but then there's been this resurgence now and factories have opened up building vacuum, then, vacuum tubes. Actually, I have seen that where they are building new vacuum tubes. So maybe, maybe there's some other way they can do it without lead and that would be probably the only option. They like the sound of the yeah. characteristics of the, of the tubes. Well, there's a, there's a belief, especially with audio, that, that like we've passed the point of good audio. Like we lost like our newer... So there might be the same thing with the video thing where we're passing this age of just like this analog age and then they're going to the digital age and maybe we're realizing that a lot of the digital age, it's quicker, it's faster, but it's not always better as far as a purist is concerned. So if you think about going full circle and then as an example of being Full circle. If you go to the computer museum up in Boston, uh, most people don't realize that the first computer was an analog computer, the vacuum tubes. It wasn't digital. It was an analog computer, and it was all real numbers, which would be, you know, varying voltages representing numbers, and. Uh, no integers or anything. So um, that was our first computer. Was was analog, mm -hmm. not digital. Yeah. And uh, there's some. I mean, in theory, there's benefits to, to that, especially over when they invented the risk processor that was all integer. Um, you lost a whole a lot of ability to do uh, deep computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A 
or uh, computations with a lot of resolution. So. Anybody else have anything? Thank you so much, guys. If you need anything else, I've got cards on the table. If you haven't grabbed one, please do so. Uh, again, if you want to, uh, if you're looking at CRTs, you can definitely check out the YouTube channel and um, do a lot of research. And again, if you have troubles or questions, you can email me and I'm, I'll try my best to answer as best I can. I don't know everything. <laughs> I mean, I've only been working on CRTs for three, or three years now. Um, but it, it's something that, that's a lot of fun and rewarding because, again, it's, it's like a forgotten technology and you're really only learning. I mean, you asked about schematics, and that's really the only way I learned about any of this stuff was reading what's called it. You just look up for a service manual on your monitor or television, and it will literally give you um, every every calibration tip and things, it, it breaks down how to do it. And it's complex, worded, uh, but it does tell you about a lot of the processes like I was talking about with the yoke and things like that. Real, real quick, Steve, I mean, for somebody that finds a PBM out in the wild, uh, I mean, can, yeah. can we get in touch with you? I mean, do you take, what, do you, would you do like rebuild on Yeah, yes, absolutely. I do that, um, especially if you're local or anything like that, that's, that's the biggest catch. I actually have people that, um, I have a gentleman from Lebanon, the country Lebanon, and he's, yeah, he's like, I, he, so he's taking his PVM apart, and I have the same PVM in my shop. He's sending me the circuit board, so I'm gonna have to do the work on the circuit boards, check them on my monitor, and then send them back to him in Lebanon, and, work on them that way so there's that kind of an option to avoid a lot of if you're capable of ripping the or taking the boards out and putting it back then there's always that option but if you're not um, you know you can always bring it here or even if you want to I mean that's the unfortunate thing it costs a lot of money if you got to ship one a long way and you're taking a lot of risk by it being broken uh, but it's doable that just adds a lot you know you're gonna spend more more in shipping if you do it that way than actually I'll charge for redoing it. Um, but yeah, so generally speaking, I, I service, 90% of my work is servicing these pro monitors anymore. And it's really getting them, re, uh, certain capacitors changed that are problematic. There's about, out of the 190, there's about 50 that are vital. Maybe not quite 50, 40, but those, um, once you change those 40 caps out generally, and then do a couple calibrations on it, it'll pretty much be set forever. Because these things were designed to be running 24 hours a day. So if they've not been running for 24 hours a day, you can usually tell because the screen isn't burned in somewhere. They easily get burned if they run that long. So um, if they've not been running that long and you, you, know, you get one, uh, it's, it's, you know, once you get it reset, you're never going to put the amount of hours on it that it was meant to do. Because even if you, <laughs> I was doing this math with somebody, if you used your PVM 10 hours a day for 10, 200 days out of the year, you're only putting 2,000 hours on it. And, you know, if it was on, if it was meant to be on 24 hours a day, 365, that's a ton of hours, you know, you'd get 5,000 a year, whatever, but... Um, but definitely if you, you know, and again, even that, see, that's really why I made the YouTube channel. I hate to say this, but it's so hard to get a CRT to me. Um, I try to help by educating other people, hopefully on getting comfortable with repairs. That's why I like, I'll do a full restoration on a video where I show everything, you know, these are the caps I'm removing. This is how I took it apart. This is how I do this and that because it's, it's, it's impossible to find a tech probably, in, I mean, I, I honestly know like three in the United States that I trust enough to send to and none of them are anywhere close to here. Like New, Brooklyn, New York, California, Southern California. And uh, 
that's like it. And then me in Tennessee, and it's like nobody else is really working on um, these things regularly. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for hanging out. All right, guys. Well, yeah, if there's anything else, feel free to shoot me an email. I appreciate your time, and uh, have fun tonight. Thank <laughs> you.